Hello, my creepy, pe my creepy people, and welcome back to finally another creepy pasta reading video. And in today's video, we are going to be reading two short creepy pastas. The first one is going to be a creepy pasta called Purgatory. The next one, I don't know what it's going to be. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but anyway, guys, uh, I have not done one of these videos in a long time, so I'm just happy to get back to them, and, uh, like I always do, I'm just a short Q Foster reader, <clears throat> and I'm going to read, uh, a extra long one for Halloween, um, and I know it's a long way away, that's just really random for me to tell you guys, but, hey, stuff. So. Alright, so, let's get into this creepy Foster, shall we? It's got a rating of 6.5 out of 10 pumpkins, so not really sure how this one's going to be, but hey. The tipper tapper of a finger echoes through the small dark room. Sometimes even whispers bounce off the walls from other rooms. Whispers that do not make sense to me. <clears throat> I would hear things like, Stop it! He'll see us! And, Quickly! Don't trust him! Or just the moans of torment and despair. Living your past over and over again until your end. Then you're back in the white room. And the flashbacks of people's departure move on to the next dorm. Sometimes the death is so horrific. Shrieks of agony seep through the thin layer of walls that separate us all. It upsets me sometimes, hearing the pain and sorrow of others. So I block my ears and close my eyes light and close my eyes tight so they don't see me crying. That's what they want. They laugh at us. Hysterical laughter echoes round the rooms like being bullied in a playground, being surrounded by people who laugh at you and pick on you. That's what it feels like. I'm not going to give them the satisfaction as the screams get more disturbing and agonized. The hysterical, the hysterical laughter gets louder and darker. When a toddler throws a tantrum at you, ignore them. Then they would stop, but they don't. Then try harder and harder until you give in. That is what these sick, these sick people do. Whenever I ignore or try to fight my senses and vision not to blur into my past, they begin to get angry and impatient. You can hear them grunting. Or sometimes they just go completely quiet. As they do, they try to make your past more enhanced and scary until you give in to the little game. So, let me give you some advice. When you die, calmly walk to the light in front of you. Don't stop, even if you get weak or weary. Don't stop until you reach the light. Ignore the person breathing down your neck, persuading you to turn back. No matter how much he sounds like your dead father, ignore him. And now we're going to move on to another one. That was, uh, 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 it was sort of confusing, but it was also sort of good as well. But now let's just search for another short little pasta. And if it's a little bit long, then we can go ahead and read it. Huh, this is like a okay one. A bit long, perhaps, but hey, it's alright. So this has been rated 8.2 out of 10 pumpkins, so let's just, let's do this. And it is called Running. <coughs> Dear Hannah, I've been doing a lot of running lately. It's an excellent way to stay in shape. Obviously, but that's not really why I do it. Mostly, I just like the fresh air and the freedom, you know? It gives me time to think. An hour or so with only my MP3 player and the pavement for company can really put those office blues and relationship issues in perspective. Like it all seems... A, w a whole world away. Not that it's an, not that it's an avoidance, 
tactic either. I really feel that this time, that, that this time to myself, just thinking helps me deal with my problems in a more level-headed and effective way when the time comes. I heartily recommend it. Just be careful, I guess. I don't quite know how to say this. A couple of weeks ago, you and I had this huge argument. It's funny. I forget what that argument was even about now. Like I said, the running, it takes your mind off things. So I was stressed, you know? Needed to get out of the house. Pound the pavement a little. Take my mind off things. I decided upon one of my favorite routes in the city. Like this. You've pretty much, you pretty much got to resign yourself to the urban scenery. But there's a nice little park not too far from where I live. You know the one? I'm sure we've been there once or twice. Ordinarily, I'd avoid the park after sundown. Just common sense, really. But I need a little greenery to improve my mood. I decided that I'd do a circuit around the outside park. Close enough to be scenic without being too reckless. It was about 10.15, so the streets weren't exactly deserted. You could go quite some time without passing another pedestrian or even seeing a car on the road. I was so glad for that, though. Usually my mind can only wander freely if I'm, com if I'm completely in a world of my own, and solitude always helps. I was glad at first, anyway, as I saw the dark outlines of the trees that lined the park come into view. I became dimly aware of a weird, creeping sense of unease. I was unable to drown out this irritational feeling with music. Even because it was around this point, my iPod began to malfunction. As it got nearer to the park, the reassuring sounds of a white striped Seven Nation Army, a classic motivation song, if a little overplayed, were steadily overtaken by a weird sort of static. <coughs> unlike anything I'd heard before. It almost sounded like a quiet, but persistent, canopy of voices speaking or laughing, but mingled together so as to create a single, unintelligible sound. I made a note that I had one more thing to deal with tomorrow. Creepy as the sound had been, a broken iPod made me, all the more determined to claim my frustrations with a nice long run. Still, I was I was starting to wish that there had been a few more people around, or that it was a little lighter out. It would have been better, even if the moon weren't really hidden behind a dark, foreboding cloak of cloud. But I pushed on. What's the worst that could have happened, right? Well, I'll tell you. As I began my circuit around the outside of the park, three foot metal fence, the large central field came into view through a break in the tree line. In the day, in the, <coughs> in the day, the field would be occupied predominantly by people playing sports, football, frisbee, running like myself, or whatever. Obviously, that was not the case at night, but neither was the field empty. A muffled cry drew my attention to the figure. No, two figures near the center of the field. One is holding the other as though it's an embrace. In fact, seemed. In fact, seemed at first that they were kissing, or possibly the larger one was nuzzling the smaller one's neck. Seemed an odd time and place for romance, but I kept on running. It was no business of mine. On the field, the larger figure suddenly jerked its head up away from the kiss? I was becoming less sure. It released a second figure, who seemed to be falling to the ground, but the view was obscured by the trees as I ran. At this time, I felt no need to stop and watch. The scene had increased my sense of unease, but I was still able to convince myself it was a couple of weirdos making in the park. As the trees thinned out, however, my illusions were swiftly shattered. The second figure was indeed lying on the ground now, and the second was crouched over it. This stopped me in my tracks, though. It was difficult to see the see in the dark, and 
I still wasn't totally convinced that I wasn't accidentally peeping on someone's weird outdoor sex capade. But then, that moon that I that I had been wishing for earlier came out. Suddenly the scene, bathed in the stark white light of almost full moon, was giving a disturbing clarity. While the distance still made some details a little difficult to make out, I could see clearly that the victims, that much was now obvious, body's limbs were jerking and violently as the hulking form crouched over it, ripping, tearing, feeding. The moonlight must have been illuminated me. <coughs> the moonlight must have illuminated me, too, because the thing in the field stopped suddenly and looked directly at me. I wasted only a second of standing there. Panic struck, but that second will haunt me as long as I live. The two eyes, which I couldn't possibly have seen from where I, from where I was, even if they were glowing, which seems impossible, burned into me. I could feel it looking at me. No, it wasn't just that. I could feel it smiling at me, with huge, jagged, uneven teeth, crammed haphazardly into a, into a maw, still bloody and red from its tastiest meal. Last meal. It smiled. I knew that much. I didn't see it. I sure as fuck didn't imagine it. I just knew. Then I ran. The road and I had been on... ran parallel to the park, and there were few turnings along its length, so I knew I had a long way to go before I'd actually be putting distance between myself and the thing. I chased a couple of glances. I chanced a couple of glances at the field as I raced down the middle of the deserted road, moving faster than I had ever thought possible, even as an experienced runner. There was the victim, left sprawled caressly onto the ground. No sign of the thing. I looked back where I was headed, and there that fucker was, perched, perched logically, mockingly on a streetlight, right in my way. How is it so fast? This was my first good look at the thing. Blood was still dripping from the wicked claws at the end of the arms that hung. Disproper dis disproportionally long. Past the light which it squatted, which it squatted, the mouth still stringing, was exactly how I'd seen it in my mind, and yet, somehow even worse, it covered a large amount of the creature's face. More than that. Seemed biologically possible. The eyes glowed a faint red intensely over all the thing. Put me in a mind of some kind of giant. A meditated monkey or deformed hairy man. I was trapped. There was no way to outrun this thing. I wasn't even sure I could start running up to close to the thing's gaze with a hypnotic. My limbs felt heavy. My eyes began to burn. I just wanted it to be over. Slowly, a loud rushing sound filled my ears. Suddenly, the thing hopped nimbly f from the light and, uh, and into a nearby tree, disappearing from sight. It was gone, but I felt headly. I felt heady. It was as though I had been marked in some unknowable way. My eyes still burned. The area around me seemed to grow lighter as though illuminated by a pale light. Rushing sound only grew louder. Then it hit me. The car, I mean. Don't worry, no major damage. The driver had seen me in time to slam on the brakes, so just bruising mostly. When I awoke in a hospital bed, the doctors told me I was a lucky man, but I'll admit it. I didn't feel so lucky when I saw the flash of red eyes and yellow teeth through my third floor hospital window. Anyway. I wrote this letter to explain why I wasn't at the hospital when you came to see me, and why you haven't seen me at all since. And well, I've been doing a lot of running lately. Pray for me. Love, Joe. Oh, uh, but yeah, guys, that was my short little creepypasta reading video for Tuesday. Um, I'm sorry if this was a little bit longer than it than it usually is. Um, I just wanted to make up for all the last time that I hadn't done a creepypasta reading video. Um, but, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed these, um, two readings. Um, be sure, what, be sure to tell me what you guys thought of them down below. And I will see you guys in the next video. Remember to keep coming, Bronion, and bye, guys.